Our session is, is, is focusing on philanthropy's role in expanding broadband access, adoption, and affordability to achieve digital equity. Uh, the, the digital divide has been an issue for, for, for some time, and the pandemic just simply exposed just how great the divide is. Uh, and this created uh, a sense of urgency in, the, in our entire world of philanthropy uh, for us to define our role or roles, uh, especially with the increased focus on, on equity. And uh, so we're fortunate, you know, to have a group uh, with us this morning who's going to talk to us a little about where Virginia is in terms of, 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 of broadband and access and so forth. And we had scheduled uh, Evan Feynman, but uh, unfortunately, Evan was unable to be with us this morning because he has COVID. But we are still fortunate to have a, a very uh, outstanding uh, a panel. And I'm going to give you their names, and then I'm going to give them the opportunity to introduce uh, themselves. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tamara Holmes, and she also has a couple of colleagues that she will be introducing. And then uh, Jerry Cuffey. Uh, and, and also helping us out this morning will be Catherine DeWitt. So at this time, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Holmes. And so I'm going to keep doing this because I did not print out a hard copy of my slides because one, I work with a lot of young folks and they're like, Tamara, you can't keep printing paper. And, <laughs> and two, we've been home for so long that I don't even know what it's like to have a piece of paper in my hand anymore because we've been doing it virtually. So I'd like to go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves so I can have an idea who's in the room. Well, I know you, Terry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. The reason I ask, and this is a, just a bad habit, I do work at the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. And while I'm here to talk about broadband, I also have another job at the agency. I am the Appalachian Regional Commission Program Manager. So I always like to know who's in the room because when I talk about ARC, um, because that's actually how I got my um, start in broadband was the Appalachian Regional Commission invested in a project um, in Southwest Virginia in Bland County. And so we actually started um, broadband as a result of all the investments we made with our federal funding. And so I just wanted to kind of share about that. So um, I am the director of the Office of Broadband. I, it is a very exciting job. It's been an exciting job even when the program was a small million dollar program and it's been even more exciting now that it's scaled up significantly and I'll give you that number momentarily. And so next slide please. No, probably the next two slides. Am I clicking? Is there a clicker here? Oh, there's a clicker. Okay, there. All right, so just to kind of share with you what we do at the Office of Broadband, and I won't read the slide verbatim, but so our biggest job is administering the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative, which is the state's primary vehicle for broadband expansion. And then we really, the one thing I think it's important for you all to know is we provide a lot of planning assistance to communities as they're thinking about broadband. And so this, we try to say we're like free consultants um, if anyone's paid attention, there's a lot of money coming down for a host of things, and so broadband is just one of those things. And while I appreciate consultants, I come from local government, um, the cookie cutter approach to broadband that you use for preparing a comprehensive plan for local government is not the same thing. And so we try to make sure that as communities hire consultants that the community's best interests are taken into consideration and that they're really specific to the expansion needs of the communities. Um, as they're doing planning, so we have staff that do that. And so the other thing we do is, um, and I'll talk about it in more detail, because we just launched our Commonwealth Connection, it's our new state broadband availability map, and I'll share that momentarily. And then 
in the infinite wisdom, as we got more money, the General Assembly said, well, we need to know how you're managing this money, and so we have to build a dashboard that I'll talk about a little bit later. And then we inherited the utility leverage program. Evan's not here, and I know you said he has COVID, but I think he was trying to avoid me since he left Virginia's government. Um, and then also gave us the LECAP, pro you know, gave us the utility leverage program, which has been interesting. And so our line extension customer assistance program actually will be launching this month, and so I'll talk about that in a little detail. And Kevin is administering that program. And then we also work with our tribal communities and any stakeholders that are interested in um, accessing federal funding. So when NCIA issued their competitive grant program, like tribal set aside funding at the federal level, we work with a lot of our federally recognized tribes to make sure they got that money from DC. And so we support a broadband advisory council and then our Commonwealth Connect Coalition and all that stuff I'll go in a little detail with uh, in a little bit. And so the number that body went from a million, it went from a million to 750 million in the five years since we've had the program. And so since the inception, the program has always been oversubscribed. We've always seen more demand than we've actually had for money. And so we went, and most folks don't know, um, I was actually on a Pew presentation I guess it was about a week ago. I was on so many presentations last week. And the, I think it was the BGR presentation, not Pew. And the guy said, Dr. Holmes has worked through two governors. And I'm like, actually, I've now worked through three governors doing broadband, because Vadi started under McAuliffe. I think no one knows that, but it actually started as a million dollar appropriation in his biennium budget for two million for, for the last couple of years of his administration. And then when Northam came in, we went from 1 million, 1 million to 5 million to 19 to 50 to 750. So the program, um, Jerry gave me the number earlier, scaled up 15 times what we originally were at. And it's funny because you were right. Our staff did not grow as fast as our budget did. Um, and so our most recent round of body, we actually received almost a billion dollars in requests for 750 million. And I like to say that. We actually only had 50 million when we opened the application cycle, and Governor Northam um, in July of last year in Avenue, Virginia said, we're gonna give them 700 million to ARPA. So when we started the applications, we actually started out with 50 million, and then it grew by 700 million with the ARPA funding. And so at that point, folks only knew we had 50 million and still came in for 943.3. And so we awarded $722 million in projects, leveraging $1 billion in funding that includes local fiscal recovery fund that the counties received, and that also includes private investment. And so what we are doing is building out universal coverage in 70 localities in Virginia. And so this is a map. And so the purple, as you can tell, is probably our most recent round of ID. And so in this map, we're showing that 70 counties will have what we consider universal coverage after the projects are completed. And um, part of the, sh the story in Virginia, and I know we're gonna play a little bit of the Grayson video in a minute, um, is really about putting the communities in the driver's seat. It's, we require a public-private partnership, and so for so long, our localities and our regional organizations have not been, have a seat at the table with the private sector as they think about broadband expansion. And so the private sector has completely been in control, as we all know, of, of broadband expansion throughout the country. And so in Virginia, when we inherited the, the funding from the McAuliffe administration, it was important, one, we're a state housing development agency. Um, we can't give money directly to a private company without going through state procurement. And if you all ever matched a state grant, you know that procurement can be a nightmare. And I can't imagine what it would be with providers. And so it was important to us that we have a public-private partnership for a body. And it's been a really successful model that's been replicated throughout the country. Um, and it really is important, I think, to put the localities in the driving seat. I'm a community development practitioner, and this was one of the things that, you know, a priority for a lot of our communities, but they were completely at the, the beck and call of the private sector. They had to wait to find out, one, they don't know where they're at, they gotta wait for them to do expansion. And so our grant funding, the ultimate goal of VADI is to supplement the construction costs for the private sector. And for us, we added public in that, and as a result, we now have 70 counties that will have universal coverage within the next three years. And so other initiatives that we have, um, the line extension customer assistance program, which I'll explain in a little more detail, and then I talked a little bit about the dashboard, and then I'll talk a little bit about the map. And so before I go any further, I'd like to, if possible, play the link for the Grayson County. Um, gotta turn the volume up, okay. And so while we're getting the, the volume up for the Grayson County 
video, remember I said we do public-private partnerships. And so I've, I will kind of preface this to, to say that in this video, you all will hear from multiple folks that play a role in what's happening in Grayson County. And I think you'll understand why the public-private partnership works really well as a model for broadband expansion. Okay. I think the best part is the first five minutes, actually. Okay. I mean, unless you want to hear from, like, the politicians, but... Well, so, we actually, so, the good thing is that when you put the localities in the driver's seat, they have to be the primary applicant provider. And so, it's actually defined by the local government. And so, I'll give you an example. So, Rhode County, Taylor, and Cork, so we, we let you come in for multiple projects in a grant round. And so, Rhode County said, all right, what are solutions for broadband in Rhode County? And so, we'll hold off and play. And so, Rhode County put out a request for proposal, and so they had multiple proposals from different providers. And they ended up with four different projects. And so they ended up with a, a private collaborative cable project, a state wireless and cable. They ended up with a fire project. They ended up with the electric cooperative unit at the table and a fixed wireless. So basically, Rhode said, we want to get every single household unit and community anchor and how do we do that? Because the thing is we have issues like poverty, so like not with value sales. And so the reason we as the finally working at the state level is because it's really at the at the to the best interest of the locality to do that. And so most localities will look at if we can get 95% of our households and business leaders and community anchors that universal coverage, because the other five percent, and I'm not so signing that right now, but it's still technology that is being developed. Um, some of those folks may never get a wireline connection, may not get a wireless connection, and satellite may be their own solution. So we put the onus on the community to define what is universal. And so based on the application that came in, seven years then we'll have a universal problem. Sam, do you have to get anything about universal? I can tell you Yeah, no, I would just add one thing. I have two daughters, they are twins, they are two years old, and their names are Keisha and Lydia. When my daughters were born, Lydia was diagnosed with pulmonary stenosis with pulmonary hypertension of the lungs. If she gets hurt, then she'll cry, and when her oxygen's low, she'll pass out because it drops even lower. It's very nerve-wracking because you don't know if it's from the injury or not. And our internet connection is not reliable, so I can't make phone calls, even for emergencies. I can't call my parents. I can't call my husband. I can't call nobody for help. I've been farming my whole life. My dad started in the 40s, and because I don't have a good internet service and I don't have cell phone service, I have to drive to our cemetery and sometimes I can't do either from there, but that's the only place we have any kind of service in the community. We miss orders because people would just can't really contact us. You know, it's it's really frustrating. Bringing internet service to rural areas is, is quite a complex challenge, and complex challenges require a lot of partnerships. We had local elected officials that stepped up to the plate who put policies in place that would allow us to go build this network. And a corporate partner like Facebook, you know, is able to bring in their large network and suppliers and help facilitate this. Without these partners, we would not be having success in building fiber today. Some of the uh, complex issues with Grayson County getting internet access to everyone is the terrain. We're full of mountains, trees, it's a few hours away from several major cities, and it's significantly more expensive to get connectivity to each home in a rural setting. Appalachian came along and offered to uh, build fiber along their utility poles, and that basically brought that cost down and made fiber to the home a possibility. So we immediately uh, began working with them to get a direct fiber connection to most everyone. This project is the first in the nation to take this approach. We are pulling fiber.
fire and attaching that to power poles uh, along the, the routes here in Grayson County. And the gig beam will actually splice that fiber and provide access points to provide the service to the customers. About 6,000 residences and businesses will be able to get high-speed internet service that doesn't have it today. Some of them are schools, some of them are emergency responding facilities that don't have proper service today. We're building 238 miles of fiber throughout the county. It opens up opportunities for everyone here and hopefully encourages people to continue to live here and more people to move into the area and build business here. Early next year, my daughter Lydia will be having an open heart surgery for a bowel replacement. And we will see the doctor every other month and we have to drop all the UVA, which is four and a half hours away. Our doctors have recommended to do telehealth, but we can't do it. We don't have that strong internet connection to allow us to do that. It's a struggle because you guys get off work, you go to book a hotel. When it's just a little simple thing, you can simply just video chat, hey, what do you think? Can you wear a for color? If we had the connectivity that we needed, a big, huge weight would just be lifted off my shoulders. I would have a peace of mind. Having a good internet connection would change our lives in a lot of ways. If we don't have a way to contact our customers, we have no business because everybody says, oh, I'll send you a text or I'll send you an email. Okay, I hope I get it. We're going to have to quit if we don't have some better internet. If we had a strong internet connection, our business would double within six months. It's a utility that's needed by everyone. So we feel that building this network is life-changing for this area. This project wouldn't have been possible without all of our team players. And that includes, of course, Grayson County, the administration, Appalachian Power, um, Gigabeam Networks, and, and of course, Facebook. Facebook brought uh, to the table technical solutions that we wouldn't have been able to have done internally. You know, we're a small regional ISP uh, with no engineering in-house, so we outsource everything we do. So Facebook helped us get that part solved. We have created a solution set that hasn't been done in this way anywhere else in the United States. And now many other organizations are working to duplicate this work. And I think the success here will create hope for a lot of rural Americans. All right, so that's the Grayson story. Did anyone have any questions about Grayson at all? No? Okay, so one of the things that Pat asked that I talk a little bit about is what made Grayson successful and what made successful. They're actually building out the project now and I guess in March I got a chance to meet with Delegate Israel Quinn who was actually the sponsor of the legislation that allowed Appalachian Power to build out the fiber in Grayson County. And so we turned on one of the rescue squads while we were there in Grayson County. It was one of the first customers for the new fiber build out. And so the Grayson project actually started out as a fixed wireless and fiber solution. And because of the addition of the partnership with Facebook and Appalachian Power, they were able to build out fiber to, as you heard Michael say, 238 miles of fiber would be built in Grayson. And so you heard some key words in that presentation, um, partnerships, right? So he talked about how Facebook and Appalachian Power were at the table and then planning. And so Grayson County actually did a survey of all their residents and it was ironic in full disclosure, we just hired the former director of IT from Grayson to now come on the state side to kind of do what he did in Grayson County to help the rest of the state. And so they did a survey, and it was funny because Carl and I talk about it. He said they did the survey via internet, right? And then they're like, wait a minute, everyone's not connected. And so they actually ended up going out to the community through the libraries and the school systems to increase the number of survey responses. And so as a result, they were able to identify the areas that were unserved. And so planning was a huge piece of how they were gonna get this solution to, the t to get broadband access to their communities. And then the other thing was important was that broadband access is not just about streaming. So it took a lot of education and awareness to folks to say the reason folks need broadband, and this is, remember, this is pre-pandemic. So you're convincing your local board of supervisors that they should invest in something that, as Michael said, is a utility, but it's not a real utility because if it was, it'd be required, right? So a lot of local officials um, don't necessarily believe that they should invest in broadband. But the pandemic changed a lot of folks' minds. I can't tell you how many counties went from like, uh, 
we're not quite sure about this thing, broadband, to, oh, crap, we really need broadband. And so um, partnerships was important, the localities being in the driving seat. Grayson was the applicant for Avadi with Gigabeam. And so, um, and then education around why broadband is important. I saw a hand. Yeah. So ironically, Facebook, if, and, not, and, and this is for anyone that's not, just, that's, that's not just based in Virginia. So Facebook, because they have these things called data centers all over the country, they need fiber. And the reason they need fiber is because they got to make sure their data centers never go down. So whether it's direct fiber build out to the data centers, whether it's redundancy, I know everyone talks about Ashburn, Virginia. Um, so that's where all of our traffic goes through. And so Facebook really quietly um, until the Grayson project was building out middle mile throughout the parts of the United States, including at least six different areas in Virginia. And so they heard about the Grayson County project and Grayson County just happens to be one of their fiber paths. And so not only are they building out fiber to support the project, they are also offering their supply chain, which for Michael, who's a small company, Michael actually was based in West Virginia before he came over to Virginia. He was a really small ISP. And he, his first project was in Bland County, which is how I know Michael from Gigabeam. And so Michael's company grew significantly from this project. He went from doing like maybe 100 home build outs with fixed wireless, and he does a small sale. So he does big towers, and then he does small sales throughout a community so that the, the wireless signal can penetrate the, the areas in the, in the hollers and the areas up on the mountain. And so, and Michael's changed his business model. So with the introduction of, introduction of Facebook, they gave him access to his, their suppliers, which also helped him buy down the cost of the fiber. So it, I, I can tell you, if you ever meet Michael, he'll go, I will go anywhere AFCO and where Git and Facebook need me to go because it's been a game changer and the return on investment has been significant. And it also has allowed him to do low cost offerings that maybe his company couldn't previously offer. Um, so Facebook is actually, and there's other areas of Virginia, I know they're doing some more fiber build outs. They, they've actually created a middle mile um, program through Facebook and I can share that information with you all so you can reach out to them to figure out where they're going. I know they've reached out to us about where they're building in the electric cooperative territory so like Madison County is one of them. I think Greene County might be another. Down route 29. Yes, down Route 29. Thank you. See that's why Chandler's here. So one, the project is still being back, built out, and I will tell you, and um, I know this is being recorded, so I will say this really politically correct. Um, there's still a conversation as to when do we really get to affordability, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about the federal resources and kind of the direction that I see Governor Youngkin have, having us go. But right now, our primary focus has been access. And so I, what we've seen, at least with the Grayson Project and several other body investments, is that the providers are all able to offer a low-cost plan um, that maybe they typically wouldn't have done. So Surrey County is a good example why the county should be in the driver's seat. Um, Surrey County partner was Rural Band and they're the Prince George Electric Cooperative. And so they said, well, we need you to lo offer a low-cost plan. And Rural Band said, well, we don't offer a low-cost plan. And Surrey said, you're going to offer one now if you want to go after this body money. And so Rural Band now offers a low-cost plan. So one, with the survey data that the counties are collecting locally, one, as folks hear about broadband, we start hearing, well, folks need to be able to afford it. And so I think what we'll share a little bit later today is where we see with the bead funding that's coming down from NCIA, how Virginia, I won't use the word pivot, how we will start um, exploring affordability. And there's been some, some movement from the General Assembly in a recent signing of a piece of legislation that I'll talk about momentarily that I think directs our agency to really start thinking about affordability. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. And so I'll share with you the line extension customer assistance program. So today is the deadline for public comment for this program. We were directed by the General Assembly to develop a program that helps connect the folks based on the needs for long drop. So if someone lives in rural Albemarle County and they live a significant distance off the road, 
if they have a particular company, I won't say the name, the company will only go up to 300 feet from the existing infrastructure and then the family has to cover the difference per linear foot to get to the house. And so that can be really expensive. It can be from $2,000, it can go all the way up to $15,000. So, and so this is what this program will cover for those families. Um, we, they do have to be low mod income per the direction of the General Assembly. And so one of the things we've done, which was important, and I, and I will say we actually borrowed this from Tiffany and the folks at the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve on their website talks about middle class. And so one of the things that was important as we were developing the income guidelines, because the General Assembly said low mod income, and then they said you go forth and develop it. And so I have a background in community development block grants. So I know what that looks like when it comes to federal grant programs, and I really was going, how are we gonna capture middle class families? How are we gonna capture the folks? And Federal Reserve um, has a great resource of information and research that they've done. And so we actually borrowed the middle class definition from the Federal Reserve Bank. And what we've done is we've actually, at the direction of our new leader, Brian Horn, is folks can go onto our website, type in their zip code, and they'll be able to find out what the income is based on their zip code. And so if you think about most federal programs, it's based on the area median income of the county, and so I use Loudoun as an example to my team. I said, Loudoun County has the highest per capita income in Virginia. And so what is low income, low to moderate income in Loudoun County if people make $300,000? And I was like, well, I wanna make sure that folks that live in Loudoun County aren't completely out of the loop because they make six figures. Because if you make six figures, then you may have $20,000 in the bank. So you wanna get it to your cable company to get internet to your house versus having a nest egg just in case something happens. And so, the maximum income for LECAP is actually 133,000 and some change. I think it might be 599 or. Um, so we really looked at the definition for middle class and looked at what, what that income would look like by zip code. So by doing it by zip code, you narrow it down to where the house is physically located and you look at the incomes within that area and you define that tax that way. As opposed to if you make this much money and you live in this county, you're locked out of this program because you're not low to moderate income. So I give credit to the folks at the Federal Reserve because they have their information publicly and that's how we develop the guidelines. So in Virginia, depending on where you live at, the area median income for the state is like 89,000 and then so we took that and said, well, 133 would be our max to qualify for recap. And so we're excited. That program actually starts this month and it's two prongs. Folks can put, apply directly to the program through our agency and then the other way is the providers who get um, folks calling them all the time, they can make a referral. But we will only work directly with the residents who need the service. So this is not a provider-driven program. It's really, so we will pay on behalf of the family, but it's really focused on the residents getting access and being empowered to, to reach out to us about it. And we're doing a lot of outreach, but we're doing a lot of outreach with our social media team and our agency. And so that's the recap. And so you see where we said hiring the recap administrator? Kevin came on April 25th. And so the broadband project dashboard was perfect timing. So I will tell you the most interesting thing, I grew up in New Jersey, and I'm still not quite sure about the four year governor in Virginia thing, right? And so Governor Northam made this great announcement in mid-December of the $722 million in body. And so 30 days later, we had an entire new administration in office and the General Assembly convening, and I kept going, oh my goodness. Um, and so the good thing that happened when we got the ARPA money um, Governor Northam made the announcement of $700 million in ARPA. The General Assembly had to vote on it. They, in their infinite wisdom, I'm not sure if I agree with it or not, split our budget. So we got $219 million in capital project funds. That's the entire allocation Virginia got. So that's one set of rules from the federal government. And then we got our, the state, state and local fiscal recovery funds, the whole different set of rules from the federal government. And then we still have our state general fund balance because we still have the $50 million. And so we have to build this dashboard and we're in the process of building it. And it's mostly going to look very much like if you've ever were really bored at night and had a glass of wine and you want to see what your VDOT project is, how they would be built out in your community. <laughs> so it'll be very much like the VDOT construction dashboard where we'll report out on how the projects are being built out and what percentage of their milestones are being met. And we kind of put them in like soft costs of the engineering done and you know, are they starting to build out? And so we have these metrics, and the good thing is that what I've heard from the new administration, they're really big on metrics, so we're actually a step ahead of the game when it comes to our broadband investments, and we've always collected this data. It's just that no one really asked us, to be honest with you, and part of it is because we didn't have as much money as we have now, right? So there's a lot of responsibility around building out broadband. So this is 
the different metrics that will be on that dashboard. And we have to update it on a quarterly basis. All right, so our, broad, our new broadband map. So the map launched officially last Thursday at our Broadband Advisory Council meeting. And so what we're able to demonstrate, and I may let Chandler, if we have time, click on the map and kind of show folks the map. Jerry is going to use it as an example later. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to steal Jerry's thunder. <laughs> um, and so I'm not going to be quiet then. So the map is great. Um, I am, grew up in New Jersey, so I like to say I'm directly challenged. So I'm not allowed to display this map and tell y'all how to use it because I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, so Jerry's going to do it. Thank you, Jerry, because yeah. I was on a presentation and I had one of my staff actually do it. But it's a great new tool. And the best thing about this map is Virginia's providers, base providers, have to give us the data. And then we have to map the data. And so no longer are we pulling down the FCC. Well, I guess it's, I don't even know if they have data now. They don't. And so no longer do we have to pull down the FCC overstated coverage data. No longer will there be an 18-month lag in data. Uh, and then we actually, in the, the budget that I hope will pass, I think, is it today? I don't know when they're moving on. But uh, we have money to keep the map going continuously. And so one thing we were asked about was how philanthropy and broadband intersect. And so I'm not going to steal Jerry Sunder. Chandler only gave me two sentences, one sentence to talk about the Cameron Foundation. So the Cameron Foundation actually came in with Dinwiddie and Sussex to provide their match funds for the body work. And so that was a game changer for Sussex and Dinwiddie because Sussex and Dinwiddie did not get a lot of local fiscal recovery fund money. And just to kind of show you the, the, the difference between the amount of money localities got. I don't know if anyone's from Hanover County. I'm sorry if I'm picking out my friends in Hanover. But Hanover County locally put over $16 million of their own money into broadband. Dinwiddie and Sussex didn't even get that type of money from the federal government through the ARPA funding. And so the Cameron Foundation came in to help provide match money for those grants, and those grants were successful. And so another example was Prentice Bank work with in Hanover. And then Isla White and King William and Southampton and, and Sussex again. And so what that allowed them to do is be able to take local money and take it and put it in other community priorities while the foundations and the bank provided, and I think the bank provided maybe two million in investment um, act, um, credits for that project. And so we have the Commonwealth Connect Fund. Folks have asked us, will this Commonwealth Connect Fund continue? We're not quite sure yet. Um, we think it will, I think it will. Um, and then it's helping communities reach universal broadband access. And then what we've heard is that the next game is going to be around affordability and adoption. And so innovative approaches. So Albemarle County um, launched their own subsidy program on top of the affordable connectivity program. And so they are now paying $20 in addition to the $30 that the affordable connectivity program is offering so that their residents that qualify for ACT are um, Oh, sorry. Okay. Y'all really want me to have this one? Okay. And so they um, offered a local subsidy, so now folks get $50 a month in Albemarle County towards their internet bill. And then Hanover County utilized the federal funding to connect those long drop folks. So they actually set up a program to do that locally within the county. And so they've, they're putting a lots of money to help those folks connect to existing infrastructure within their county. And so for Avadi, so I got permission. I can give you guys the governor's talking point on broadband. So one thing we're proposing in Vadi to really be in lockstep with the new federal program under um, the Infrastructure Act is we propose to change the definition, not the definition, what's considered unserved in Virginia. So right now, anyone that has below 25 over three is considered unserved. We propose that to go up to 100. So anyone below 100 over 20 would be considered unserved based on our guidelines. And so our guideline comment closed on the second. So we're in the process of compiling all of the comments and then we'll be launching our new guidelines in later this month, I think on March 20th, we'll be launching our guidelines. It may be on the 19th at the Virginia Broadband Summit. And so the other thing is preparing Virginia for the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act through the BEAD program. And so I can now tell you the governor's talking point. So what we've, um, at the Broadband Advisory Council, Secretary Karen Merrick, who's the Secretary of Commerce and Trade, talked about Governor Junkin's focus on broadband, and so I'm gonna try to get this right. He is focused on making sure that every single Virginian has affordable, 
reliable, high-speed internet. And so I think I've got to buy affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. And what that looks like, we're still working, right? Because one, they've been off in office a little over 100 days. We are still working on a state budget. And so with the body guidelines that will be launched at the end of, more towards the end of the month, folks will be able to understand the direction moving forward a little bit more. And then the other thing that's important is that there are a couple of bills that passed the General Assembly that the governor recently signed, and one of them is the broadband affordability plan. So to your question about kind of around affordability, this directs our agency to actually develop a plan that's due to the General Assembly and the governor by December 1st on um, digital affordability and cost effectiveness. And so this gives us an opportunity to really start, as we're still continuing to close the digital divide in Virginia through access, to start really looking at affordability and a part of the direction is how do you access this federal money and what will we do with this federal money? And so I know Evan wasn't here to present earlier, but we're looking at three different, I'll call pillars, um, access, adoption, and affordability. We think we'll be looking at that through this, this plan we'll be developing. So stay tuned for more information because if you're based in Virginia, we probably want to hear, you, hear your voice as a stakeholder. And so the other piece, this was a bill um, proposed by Senator Pillion in Southwest Virginia, and so this to me is another indication that we're kind of looking at, looking at access, affordability, and adoption because now it directs our agency and the Department of Education to collect specific data from school districts in Virginia on student access. And so if anyone's, a, I'm a parent in Chesterfield County, and so I got a question that said, do you have internet? And I said yes or no. That was kind of it, right? So we don't know any details about the student access, what type of service they have, can they afford to pay for it? So we'll be developing a survey, and actually, um, Karen, Catherine, to put on your to-do list, one of the things I learned when we got together in D.C. earlier this year was about the education superhighway and that survey that the city of Oakland had done. So I'm really curious as to, because Oakland collected localized data um, with community partners, and I'm curious how we can replicate that in Virginia, because I feel like that was a robust survey and collected a lot of good data. So, yes. And so we feel like we'll be able to start, again, thinking about affordability and access and adoption. And so with that, that actually officially concludes my portion of the presentation. And yep, that's all I had. Okay. Thanks. And I don't have any slides, but my name is Jerry Cuffey. I'm with the Cameron Foundation. Cameron is a health conversion foundation based in Petersburg, and we serve the surrounding area that was the footprint of the hospital that went into the creation of our foundation. So uh, apologies for a couple things. One, this is my first time speaking live panel uh, in about two or three years, so I'm still getting used to have, to have socks and shoes on. And then uh, other piece, I'll be talking about this issue for, till well past lunch, so I brought notes to make sure that I don't go too far off the rails. So Cameron, we, we weren't doing anything with broadband in 2019. Um, and I think we were kind of aware individually that this was important and probably should be considered a utility, but we weren't doing any grant making, no dollars were going out the door in support of this. Uh, and then early in the pandemic, we had two of our emergency grant programs centered around our school divisions. So there was one in April 2020 that was to help schools adjust to having to do virtual learning. And then there was one in August 2020 to help with whatever the new school year was going to look like, whether you needed PPE, whether you needed uh, new vents or HVAC systems, or if you needed new technology. And so with those two grant programs, we pushed out around $700,000. Uh, our grant budget annually is about $4 million, to put that in perspective. And almost all of that went to internet hotspots and devices. And it wasn't just in the rural areas. A uh, city like Petersburg, which ostensibly has com pretty much complete broadband coverage, they had high demand for hotspots because, to Clark's point, they, a lot of folks there couldn't afford it. Um, and so that's how we got into it. So through the school systems, we started to get a picture of how big the need was in our service area. And then, uh, so we started talking with folks in more earnestness about this. And one of the things that we came to believe 
uh, which is not radical thinking, is that broadband is more than a quality of life issue. It's needed for employment opportunity, educational opportunity, health opportunities. And in fact, in March, the University of Chicago released a study that said that one of the key factors contributing to increased risk of death from COVID was access to internet. And they found that held, they controlled for socioeconomics, for income levels, for whether or not you were rural or urban, it didn't matter. If you lacked access to internet, you were more likely to die from COVID, uh, which puts it in very stark terms, I think, for me, in that for the first time there's, that I saw, there's evidence that this was literally a life or death issue. Um, and so we viewed this past year, Tamara talked about how their grant budget in the VATI program swelled from 50 million to 750 million in one year. So this VATI program, just to give the elevator pitch of it, uh, a community can submit a plan in partnership with an internet service provider to fund the build out of internet services. And the state will pay up to 80% of the project cost, but you still have to come up with a 20% at least match. It's not just in, it has to be a cash match to get there. Um, and so while it was a unique opportunity, we viewed this frankly as a once in a generation opportunity. Uh, it was really challenging. So, uh, oh, perfect, you got the map up. So this is the cool new map that, uh, thank you, that Tamara was just referencing, which to put this in perspective also, the FCC was what we were relying on previously. The, so I see some nods. So, yeah, we could toggle, yeah, I'll let Chandler. So what FCC, if you're, they defined it down to census block. And so if one address in a census block had broadband coverage, according to the FCC map, that entire census block had broadband coverage. So we knew it was bad but we didn't know how bad it was until this detailed map came out. This is what the FCC says. So this is Sussex County right here in red, which is one of the two counties that Cameron wound up working with. And if you would switch it over to that 95%. Perfect. Uh, and get rid of the FCC. Awesome. Okay, so this is what really is. So it was bad no matter what. But just to put that in perspective, if it's dark blue, that means you've got that 95% internet coverage threshold that Tamara was talking about. And at the speed that they're hoping to redefine broadband as, which is that 100 millibytes per second download. I didn't know what this meant um, two years ago. So the way I like to think about it, the old definition, which was 25 millibytes per second download speed, you could probably do stream one movie in your household with that if you weren't really interested in high definition. Um, but uh, if you were like me, uh, so in 2020 and early 2021, I was working from home because I was fortunate enough to have that luxury doing numerous Zoom calls as you were too, I bet. I had three kids in the house doing virtual schooling at the same time. Uh, we. <laughs> 25 would not have allowed that. So uh, what VADI is proposing to do is raise it to like a real definition of what a minimum threshold of broadband. So anyway, Sussex County and Dinwiddie, we knew had these big swaths where there wasn't any type of broadband coverage. And so the plan that we came up with was very similar to what the video showed. So our local electric cooperative, which is Prince George Electric Cooperative, they worked out deals with all the other electricity providers in those counties to run fiber broadband cable on their utility poles. And so that was a huge cost saving right there. But also fiber, I hate the use of the term future proof because I doubt anything is truly future proof, but I think fiber is the best technology we have available right now because signals are going through there at close to the speed of light. Um, and it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where we're talking better than light speed. But uh, that's what we're gonna put together. And so the, what we're talking about is between Dinwiddie and Sussex County, an area of 1,000 square miles, approximately 40,000 people between the two counties. And so they're pretty dispersed. Um, 
And the total project cost, I'm going to use the, the VADI application figures here. The total project cost to extend broadband, universal broadband coverage to the rest of those counties was $27 million. Uh, again, our grant budget per year is $4 million. So that is nowhere in the realm of something that we could possibly consider. But with this VADI program, uh, it became possible. And so we, what we did, and Tam Tamara teed this up beautifully, uh, Dinwiddie and Sussex, even though this was a great one-year, one-time opportunity to get this huge pot of money and achieve universal coverage in their counties, they couldn't meet the match by themselves in one year. It was too big of a lift. Um, and so we pledged $1.15 million toward helping them meet their match if they came in at $1.15 million themselves. And then Prince George Electric Co-op had to provide a certain amount themselves. And then the county administrators were able to turn and go to their board and say, hey, we've got this one-time infusion of federal funds that we could apply to this. The Cameron Foundation is willing to help us get halfway there. Let's do this. And they were able to get it passed by their board of supervisors. And fortunately, VADI approved that. So we're on a timetable now where by the end of 2023, uh, this map will be completely the dark gray that we're, we're talking about. And uh, the contracts still haven't quite finished up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks. This is something uh, that we're very excited about. And I have to give a huge plug to Catherine was asking me prior to this session what I thought of VADI. And I have extremely high opinion of VADI. Like their staff is extreme. I'm not saying this just because they're in the room. They're uh, extremely responsive. Uh, as we referenced, when their budget shot up from 50 million to 750 million for this one grant budget program, you wouldn't have known from the outside that their staffing had to be scrambling like crazy. They were incredibly responsive. They're great partners. And they're going to be great partners going forward because the real pivot is toward the affordability piece. We've got to build out the, the networks for it to even be an option, but the affordability piece is going to be harder. This was a relatively easy sell to my board because even though it was really expensive, COVID really exposed how important broadband access was, but also there's an exit strategy as a funder. Like we do this one time investment and then we can get out and then we get to brag and we get to stand up here about like the leverage that we were able to have with our dollars because we same way that he calculates it by our calculation our 1.15 million is leveraging over 25 million in federal state private local funds uh to get this done and provide a valuable service so i've already done it i've gone way off the rails yeah chandler sorry
That's, and that's a really key point because I know a lot of the localities that we work with, they just don't have that office staff capacity. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I see a lot of head nods, so I don't need to go any further into that. Um, I do want to say that I think that the, uh, the governor's team, Evan Feynman, who's not here, uh, took a big risk by putting 700 million in federal relief funds into broadband. And I, when I would talk with Evan about it, I could sense the nervousness sometimes, like, gosh, if we plow this much money in this program and we don't get the grant applications to match it, then we're gonna get hammered on this. Um, and of course, it went the opposite direction where they had to turn down over 200 million in grant requests. But one of the things about that is I feel like it moves Virginia, of we stole a march on the rest of the nation um, in that oh, some of the supply chain snarls that are inevitably gonna come with this, we're a little bit ahead of this. I was talking about this last week with the folks at Prince George Electric Co-op, and they said no supply chain issues so far. Everything's moving along in terms of getting the physical fiber cable in place that they need to do this build out. So I think that the rest of the nation is coming in the next year or two but we're a little bit ahead of the curve right now. Um, and so I know we want to pivot to what philanthropy can do. So where do you want me to go now? So, sorry, Patty. Do you want to kick it over to Catherine now? Okay. Do you want me to bring the mic to you? Do you want to come? Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, you know, following folks like Jerry and Tamara and the entire team from Virginia is uh, also it's great because uh, I actually don't have a ton to add. Um, but um, because uh, normally I talk about the great work that teams like the body team are doing. Um, but I do want to add um, a few things just to give you all a sense of nationally um, kind of where Virginia fits in and also just kind of the moment that we're in. Um, but I also do just want to take a brief moment to just say like, take a breath. If anybody else is feeling overwhelmed, I know that I'm sitting here listening to everything happening and I feel this way often. Um, there's a lot going on. It's overwhelming for anybody, even as somebody who has been working on broadband and digital equity for about a decade now. I am very overwhelmed by what's going on, and I advocated for a lot of the bills that we're implementing right now. I lobbied for them, so sorry. Um, but I, I think the thing that I will add, I'm actually not sorry, I'm quite proud. Um, but the thing that I will add is that this is a solvable problem, um, and it's solvable because of the leadership from the folks who are sitting right in this corner right here, and because of partners like all of you. And that's not a hype talk, that's not a pep talk, um, that is the honest to God truth backed by evidence and research um, from the folks on my team um, and from other organizations. Um, Virginia is, and I am not petting egos again because they're in the room, Virginia is in such a good place, um, not because uh, just the team has the track record and the experience um, and the poise. <laughs> Uh, to handle this moment. You also have a team full of accomplished civil servants who are willing to problem solve and who do really put communities at the seat, at the head of the table. Um, but they are also very clear-eyed about the realities of policy. And I think that that, candidly, has been one of the challenges that we've seen in Washington and in states is that you have very well-intentioned folks coming in and saying, we are going to solve this because we are going to make this a moral argument about broadband and the, the social value that it has. There is social value attached to broadband. I will get to that in a few minutes. It is, is an enabler. It is the great enabler. However, it is still overwhelmingly provided by for-profit entities. It employs, the industry employs a lot of people across the country. It is a huge money maker. There are a lot of assets that have been invested in this. So people are going to protect their corners as they should, as they will. So what you have in Virginia are a team of folks who understand the policy backwards and front. They have advocates in Washington who are advocating on behalf of the state and communities here. They're also trusted voices. So um, I think that the, um, in some states I don't get to open things like that. Actually in almost every state I don't get to open with things like that. Um, so 
I'm really looking forward. Hopefully this is the first of many conversations I'll be having with all of you to talk about the progress happening in Virginia. Um, and please consider us a resource moving forward. Um, but going back to the point about kind of what this moment means and how the field itself has shifted, um, we really are seeing broadband being viewed as um, as close to a utility as much as something can be without being a regulated utility. Um, and really what that means is someone uh, or, or people and lawmakers viewing this as I don't have to think about this. I shouldn't have to ask if broadband connections are going to be in a home uh, at a residential unit when I purchase it. it it's like electricity, it should just be there. Um, and so what steps do we need to take? What policy do we need to change or unravel um, in order to make sure that that happens? Um, and we've seen progress happening across states really um, starting in 2017 was when we st started to see a lot of rapid change across states. And that was because rural lawmakers in particular were getting a lot of phone calls from angry constituents saying, we are supposed to be getting broadband. The, fed the feds say that we are supposed to be getting broadband. The maps are saying that we are supposed to have broadband. It's not here. Our towns are dying. What are you gonna do about it? So we actually saw more movement in conservative states, in largely rural states, to put more community-focused and community choice um, policy solutions around broadband than we did at the federal level, really starting around 2017. So when you hear in Washington, this is something led by Democrats, this is a, this is a, blue, this is a blue issue, it's not. In states, really in states, it's purple. It is the purplest of pur purple issues and working for a nonpartisan organization, we love that. It's great because state lawmakers across the board agree they recognize this is the best for the health of their states, it's the best for the health of their communities, it is for the survival of their communities. So um, part of the reason why we are continuing to do this work though is because it's not about the technology itself. We've all kind of touched on this point. And um, when we are looking at the um, definitions of things like speed, of uh, the types of technology that are being deployed, about things like affordability, these can seem sort of wonky and they get very wonky and technical very quickly. Um, you don't necessarily need to get into the tech and the wonk, but you do need to understand why those things matter. And ultimately they matter for uh, the utility and usage of technological applications, how folks can use these connections for things like education and healthcare, as we have all unfortunately learned in the last two years. And then getting to uh, Clark's point earlier, how are folks able to afford, can they afford it? Are they able to use it in a meaningful way to improve their lives? Are business owners able to use it? Can they connect with their customers? And all of those things, speed, the type of technology, uh, the cost itself, um, those are all reflected in policy. So again, you don't need to understand kind of the, the really nitty gritty of, you know, what's the difference between, I don't even know, you guys can rattle these examples off, but you just need to understand why those things matter and why people tend to get a little riled up about them. But what we advocate for are higher speed minimums, let's build for the future, not build for yesterday. Let's focus on improved accountability. If you're taking funds from the public sector, from the taxpayers, let's make sure that we are actually ensuring that the taxpayers get what they are promised. Let's also make sure that those connections are affordable and that there are options for low income uh, households because we don't see an economic benefit from broadband from the infrastructure itself. It only matters when people use it. And that's where uh, an alliance that we just launched called Opportunity Broadband comes in. And we have this moment right now where we have more stakeholders coming to the table, not just funders, but educators, uh, healthcare institutions, businesses saying, we don't have a workforce that's ready for these connections. We're making a $65 billion investment in broadband digital equity. You know, we've got people who, one, we can't fill jobs right now, but two, we don't have people who can staff front desk offices to fill out forms appropriately. Can you help us with that? We say, yeah, come on in. Come join our tent. So there's a workforce challenge. We have a policy challenge around things like telehealth and uh, using uh, virtual and hybrid care. 
Uh, we have a lot of questions around credentialing teachers. How are we really preparing students and also supporting our educators and school systems to make sure that we are thinking not just about what our workforce and children need to be prepared for the economy three years from now, but five and ten years from now. That's a lot of transformation change, and as we all know, policy moves like molasses. We need research. And I'm not just saying that because I work for a research organization. <laughs> I am a little bit. Um, but more importantly, we need other voices coming to the table, validating what advocates like me, uh, what the very accomplished civil servants in the back are saying, that this is not just about the technology, it is about what this will mean for all of our communities. So we launched Opportunity Broadband earlier this year to create space for those conversations to happen and for us to be able to build that community. Um, one of those communities that we are hoping to build is for funders, to help educate funders on the various roles that y'all can play in supporting uh, state and local initiatives. We've talked about a lot of those examples today. Matching funds is an immediate short-term area where y'all can make a huge impact. Um, providing support for devices. These are relatively low-cost investments. You don't need to have $10 million to make a huge impact. Yeah, Y'all would know better than I would. <laughs> You don't need to have millions of dollars at your disposal to make an impact. Sometimes it can be covering the cost of a consultant to help with a broadband planning project. Sometimes it is a multi-million dollar investment uh, to cover um, internet subsidies to certain households for, certain, for a certain amount of years. Sometimes it is about working with uh, a team of researchers to figure out how you are actually going to attract a new employer or to redevelop an economic a regional economic development strategy that is around tech-enabled opportunities that are using this investment in broadband to make sure that you don't have any more population loss in that area. So there are a lot of ways that y'all can engage, um, and we hope that Opportunity Broadband can facilitate um, some of that learning. Um, part of it is also about telling the stories and the impact that this lack of access is having on your communities. Um, why do you care? Why did you come to this table? Why did you come to this session? Why are you asking Patty for support in this area? Um, and then I think finally is establishing continuous systems of learning. Um, part of the reason that organizations like mine uh, got involved in this space and why there are so many other organizations getting involved now is that we are fundamentally solving for a scarcity gap. And that's a scarcity of expertise. Um, the Virginia team has done a phenomenal job <laughs> uh, responding to this uh, deluge of funding that has come their way there are not enough qualified people in this space to meet the need in the public sector, to meet the need in the nonprofit sector, to meet the need in research. Um, and part of it is that there was a lot of learning loss that occurred since the last significant federal investment. We cannot let that happen again. So we wanna make sure that we are all connecting, sharing information, uh, going through project evaluations as uh, these projects are occurring so we can multiply and accelerate the impacts of these funds. So we can also go back to lawmakers and say, we had a good impact. Let's talk about how we can keep a good thing going. So I'm happy to take questions about the everything I just kind of dumped on you. Happy to talk about my team's research that we've been doing for the last four years on what's effective with state broadband programs. Happy to talk about broadband in general if you have questions. It's a safe space. This is confusing. Um, or Patty, just turn it over and we can just start talking shop.
I'll stand up. Thank you. Hi, Tiffany from the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. And my questions and comments are my own, not those of the Federal Reserve Banker system. Um, so one of our, our initiatives I spoke with you about, Catherine, is uh, we are trying to provide technical assistance and support across the Federal Reserve System to states that are interested in accessing the Digital Equity Act funds for some of these challenges around um, ability, diversity, as well as uh, literacy, access to equipment, rural communities that are trying to um, uh, take more of, of, of a bottom-up approach. And I know we've, we've talked about it. I, I want to be sensitive to um, any decisions and, and approved talking points. But I'm curious if Virginia would be interested in participating in a cohort of other states that are also trying. One, because I think they can learn a lot from what you're just doing well, naturally. I mean, the examples you've provided, the videos of communities that have really, just with the resources you had, started moving forward. Um, but also, you mentioned a couple of times some of the challenges around addressing this affordability issue. Um, and we would love to have you as part of that conversation. You don't have to answer now. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. We can, we can follow up when you get back from, from your vacation. Um, go ahead, Catherine. The state and the, D, the Digital Equity Act implementation, when we're talking about the infrastructure bill itself, which is now apparently being rebranded, the bipartisan infrastructure law. So people will either refer to it as the, huh? Yeah, it's not IIJA anymore, it's BIL. Come on, guys. Come on, it's bipartisan. Yeah. So the BIL, formerly known as IIJA. Anywho, so. There are a couple of key um, sources of funding in there that overlap with states, one of which is the BEAD program, the Broadband uh, Equity Access and Deployment, Deployment. Deployment thank you, uh, act program. And then another is the Digital Equity Act. Um, states have an overlapping role with both. Um, where states are in the, are the administering authority on BEAD, Open question on D, yes, on administering the authority on DEA, but open, as long as, you take as long as you take charge. So there are some open questions there on the role of states in DEA. We are currently working with more than 30 states to provide technical assistance, um, free consulting support to help them prepare for implementing all of these federal funds. I'll stop yelling into the microphone. Yes, that is a bad idea, which is what we are discouraging them from doing. Take the money. And as they're thinking about planning for these funds, part of what states will have to do through the BEAD program is submit a five-year action plan. Part of the, one of the strengths of the BEAD program itself is that we are talking about universal affordable access. No more cherry picking on project areas. No more picking households and service areas just because they're profitable. If you are taking that money, you are providing connections to every single household in that service area. You also need to make sure that that's affordable. So that is getting at a different side of equity in a way that folks are not really talking about in the way that the field has traditionally talked about equitable access. But part of what we are encouraging states to do, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Virginia, um, obviously, um, but part of what we are encouraging states to do is to build their digital equity strategy into that BEAD program and then to use that DEA planning process as more of an operationalization, like more of an operations plan. So use the BEAD five-year action planning process to say, here's how the state was planning on using these BIL funds in order to address the unserved, underserved, um, and uh, affordability device challenges. Here's how we would eventually plan on using the DEA funds and then actually articulate their, oper their operations plan through the DEA plan itself. But really use, if you've got two bites at the pie on planning and moreover, the opportunity to engage stakeholders and bring them along in that process, particularly around digital equity, which there are still a lot of doubters on that piece, do it. Just bring them along through that entire process. And this is really something that Chandler came up with, so I can't take credit. When the governor signed the broadband affordability plan that we have to develop by December 1st, we kind of took it as a direction, well, oh, wait a minute. They just told us to go develop Virginia's digital equity plan before we even know what's required of the 
digital equity plan from NTIA. And so when Chandler said that, I was like, oh, we'll be a step ahead again, right? And so I'm really excited about it because it, I can't say it was a bipartisan effort. Chandler knows the vote breakdown. Um, but I think it gives us an opportunity to really pull together stakeholders to have a different conversation around, and in Virginia it's opportunity, not equity. Um, so around digital opportunity. So I'm, I'm excited and I'm looking forward to, we're actually working on developing the work plan now as to how we'll deliver this plan to the Governor and General Assembly by December 1st. And then um, we'll see what the next, you know, what's the next big thing and how we'll be directed to invest the bead money, which I think will hit some of the equity pieces. I'm, I'm excited about it, to be honest with you. Oh yeah, so under the previous administration, um, Governor Northam did allocate $30 million um, to five affordability projects, and they, there was a wide variety of project types. Um, one, the city of Hopewell did a really innovative project where they built out a public Wi-Fi mesh system for the entire city. Okay, it's not, it's not like big as Williamsburg, it's a small city. Mesh networks are, okay. <laughs> No, not really. I, I mean, it's. And I mean, I. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, look. Look. Yes. Yes. See. <laughs> see, I didn't know enough to be dangerous, but not to do all the explanation. That's why I have three engineers on staff. Right, yes. Uh, so it can be deployed faster. I don't know whether or not that's actually true, but that's what the engineers are. And so Hopewell um, came in for CARES Act funding and they built out this public Wi-Fi network and then they made it accessible to their low-income families. So kind of like, I won't say what company I have because I'm really not happy with them right now, but like when I drive around, every time I go past a Wi-Fi network for my provider, it pops up on my phone like, hey, log in. So it's very much similar to the to, for folks to be able to log in anywhere within the city to have access to Wi-Fi, to connect their phone, connect their computer, their tablet. And so that was one of the projects that typically gets raised up as an example of investing in affordability. And then there were a couple of projects where um, communities focused on distributing hotspots um, to, to their residents. And one of the things I've learned and I've shared with my colleague in Washington, D.C., was that be careful about what you put in that agreement because if you put information in that agreement around the, the resident's responsibility for it, they're not gonna take that device. And part of it is most of the times we're getting devices from your kids in school and you're coming home with it. Well, what I've also learned, if you live in Southern Chesterfield and Western Henrico, you can go home with a hotspot, but guess what? You can't use it because you don't have cell service. Um, so everyone sent kids home with hotspots, but a lot of them couldn't use it. And so I know James City County was one of the, the projects they did for the hotspot. And it didn't quite work out because they put all these restrictions on, if you get it, this is your responsibility. And so, it was the first time where we were able to kind of put some money into affordability and really see what the outcomes would be. And Hopewell has been an example. What was the other? There was another one. Okay, so Providence has replicated Hopewell. There was another one. Oh yeah, Martinsville did one as well. And then Arlington County did a public Wi-Fi network. It was interesting. The one things we learned from the, from the Arlington County project is, did anyone know that there were hills in Arlington County? and you can't propagate a wireless signal where you think you might propagate it in Arlington. They're like, oh, it's not Southwest Virginia, we can do this. And so again, we have free staff, staff that are free consultants who have technical expertise if folks are thinking about doing um, public Wi-Fi networks to get their low-income residents access to internet. So yeah, thanks Chandler for reminding me about the affordability projects. I think the, so one of the interesting things about all of this with the affordability piece and going back to sort of like what we know and what we don't know um, and why it's so great to have funders at the table and also teams like this is people are like, okay, well, we'll put a number down for what affordable means for low income families across the country and set that national standard. Like, thank you. <laughs> no. <laughs> because as Tamara pointed out earlier, like that that's gonna be very different in specific parts of the county, let alone just within the state. So, you know, we've already got, you know, I've got public interest groups saying, 
you know, we don't think that this, you know, this level set for the, you know, uh, the affordable connectivity program is enough, and it's got to be at this. And I'm like, well, where's your, where's your data on that? Like, it's, I mean, it's, uh, let's have the conversation, but sh show me the data. Talk to me about a formula that states can be using, that community partners can go out and that they can use. Talk to me about a survey that bring me the information that we can use to deploy so we can set a formula that we can actually get that information and so we can do, set something that is reasonable and i'm i'm not saying this to sound like the to sound defeatist or negative but i think that there's a there has been in some ways a lack of um nuanced discussion around this because we have in many ways uh divorced the um broadband itself from the impact that it has on communities because we have talked about it so long as this it's about the market it's about the profitability it's about this technology we have moved it away from the fact that it really is a kitchen table issue this is about the households that it that it impacts we had um, we worked with the University of Southern California who works with a group called the California Emerging Technology Fund. I'm not trying to start like an East Coast West Coast war here, but like you want to put like two states together that like you know are gonna. When people ask, we we don't pick favorites at Pew. Can you cut this from the recording? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, California is like Virginia. They've got a really comprehensive program. They think very locally, um, but. They've, fo they've been focusing on affordability and equity for quite some time, and part of the way that they've been able to achieve that is they, they focus on building that durability in throughout government, throughout government operations. So they have an organization whose job is really to make sure where are we embedding digital equity in through all of our government services. Now, sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not, fine. Um, but they work with researchers, including at the University of Southern California, to gauge the effectiveness of their programs. And what they found is that about a quarter of low-income households were cutting costs on food and clothing to pay for internet during the pandemic. And we don't think we need to have a bigger cost about, or a bigger conversation about affordability. People are making a choice between groceries and their internet bills, come on. So I, I think that it's just the where y'all can provide testimony and perspective on this is what the monthly household costs look like. This is what a monthly budget looks like in our communities. Um, and you bring a different perspective to the table um, than a lot of advocates like me um, just can't. Um, so any other? Can, can you pull that thread through a little bit? Do you mean signing up? Do you mean using? Virginia, it's not really public yet, so I know this is being recorded, but one of the first things when Governor Young, I, I kid you not, I don't know how Microsoft got in with Governor Youngkin so quickly, because I think we were, so we were at a, so he got in, so Microsoft had a meeting with Governor Youngkin, and so Microsoft, and if you don't know, you'll know today, anytime you do an update with Microsoft, they take a speed test. So Microsoft has been collecting usage data, and so we've been asked by the governor's administration to figure out how, with our new broadband availability map, how we can partner with Microsoft, because what we feel like the Microsoft data tells us for Virginia, and what they said was like, it was like four times the number of unserved then, and we were like, wait, 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 wait. Usage and access are two different things. What people use <laughs> when they've got access versus not having anything. And so Microsoft is building a digital equity dashboard. I don't know when exactly it's gonna go live. I was on a presentation with BGR last week about it, and I brought it up. And so one of the things we're gonna do is, we partner with Microsoft with the folks from Virginia Tech, and we're gonna start peeling back the layers of um, 
the data with Microsoft and the data from Virginia Tech. The only problem is, is the Microsoft data is by zip code, Virginia Tech's data, we, we, we can break it out by zip code, but we have to go back and get permission because when we got the permission to collect the data, we can't do anything with the specific addresses. So we've got to get permission, right now it's census blocks. So we're really looking forward to the partnership with Microsoft because we think it will help us not pivot, but help us really as we develop that digital affordability plan for the Commonwealth because that data is really useful. Um, Tim, what else did we discuss with Microsoft around that? Do you remember anything else I should add? As well, make sure that the private sector data, Microsoft, you know, other folks out there too have different data sets. You know, it just helps us cross verify what we're doing as far as mapping, cross verify usage, see how people are using their connections, what speeds they're subscribing to. So, you know, it really enables a lot of, you know, cross checking on our end. And the data is available across the country. So, it's not unique to Virginia, it's just that Microsoft, one of the first meetings that Governor Youngkin had was with Microsoft. Well, it's also interesting, sorry, Patty, be, there's no, uh, really agreed upon standard for digital competency that's used by industry. So it, depending on which industry you're talking to, they will point you to a different data set. So when we were standing up Opportunity Broadband, this was something that Microsoft, Boeing, the major employers down to small regional economic development groups would say, could you just solve that problem? And I'm like, well, can't you all just agree on it? And they were like, no. Um, but I, I think that there's, and maybe the Federal Reserve, um, maybe y'all have a, no, I know, you're like, good luck. Um, but I, I think that there, to your point though about who is doing that adoption well, um, there are a couple of organizations that we can get you plugged in with. Um, Microsoft has been leading the charge through uh, one, one group is the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, they have access to a huge community of practitioners who are doing this at the local level. They are also working with NTIA and other partners right now to surface some of these uh, really effective methods um, of reaching to specific populations. But exact why I asked you to kind of dig into it a little bit more is ex what the answer that you gave is exactly why I asked because people say, okay, broadband adoption. How do, we, how do we do it? How do we do it right? And it's like, well, that's a big question. But you know, you walked through the um, caretakers for students. Um, you walked through folks understanding how to do price comparisons when they're on a phone versus when they're using a platform on a desktop. Um, and there was a third example, I'm sorry, that's evading me. But the, so you're talking about a couple of different skill sets there and really thinking about um, the um, steps that one would go through in order, and different ways to connect with those populations and different inroads. So I'm not giving you a satisfying answer, no. but I can point you to folks who can. Yeah. Sure. 
So we do know that Governor Youngkin is committed to continuing to close the digital divide, and what that looks like will depend on what we're going to have a state budget and what, you know, we know we're going to get a $100 million initial allocation from BEAD. We've got to develop this plan. There's some inconsistencies from the federal government when exactly that money will be coming. And so we do know that at least we're going to continue the body program. And, that, and again, this is a bipartisan, pro, this is a program that's supported by both sides of the aisle, um, at least according to our Virginia Cable Television Association, <laughs> when, they, when they come talk to us. They go, everyone loves body. Everyone's calling me from across the country. So at least we know that we'll continue to close the digital divide so that all Virginians will have access to, to broadband from an access standpoint. And then again, I think I really feel like the, the broadband affordability plan we'll be developing will help us develop the strategy to figure out what the next thing is for Virginia around the bead investment. And Chandler's probably going to have to tell you the four buckets that bead can be used for, because I cannot remember but one of them. And one of them is devices. Um, the other one's public, multifamily, residential access. Body is still one of the eligible uses, and there's always the fourth one, I forget. Yeah, so I guess we're trying to say, too, Yeah, so, yes, yep. Yeah, and then in terms of, I think that the folks that are in this room, I mean, Cameron gives an ex a good example, the PATH Foundation gives an example of the investments they've made on the access side. And I think there's definitely opportunities on the affordability side. Kevin and I actually had a call with a group based out of Northern Virginia. They're, it's a nonprofit that gives folks computers but they also have a broadband navigator program. So they actually have volunteers that work with their nonprofit to walk people through, you know, now that you have access, now that you have a computer, what do you do with it? And so there are many groups in Virginia that we'll be calling upon to be a part of our stakeholder group to help us develop the strategy for Virginia. But I think that, you know, access is one piece. We'll still keep doing that. The affordability piece, what that looks like, we'll be developing a strategy for G Virginia moving forward. Um, I do know that when we <laughs> talk to the folks at Pew and there's an equity report card, I'm not going to tell you the grade Virginia got, but let's just say if I got that grade when I was in school, I would have been on punishment. Um, so, so I'm really excited about having an opportunity to <laughs> move Virginia further up in the report card grade around equity. Those CRA money. Just a quick question um, for the room to help me kind of think through a few things. So I have a program officer who um, invests in the Northern Neck grant dollars, right? And uh, my foundation specifically is kind of restricted on who we can give grants to through the will. Um, so we try to be creative about going outside those, you know, that, that, those restrictions. So going into our endowment for lending is a big piece for us. And that allows us to get outside and to and get our capital to folks who normally couldn't get it. So my question to y'all, I totally see where, you know, grant dollars filling in the gaps helps. Are there examples or situations where you can do lending um, to help kind of push this forward? And it, I mean, but it's, it's to get, even if it's a return of capital with no um, interest involved, but use that money for cash bridge, you know, cash flow uh, challenge you may have. But I'd love to hear some examples of folks who have done that successfully and how it's very, you know, useful to kind of move the broadband question, especially in rural areas. I'll just be I'll just be brief on this. You know, uh, in terms of you know small internet service providers that are entering the marketplace to do these you know transformational projects, a lot of the times you know when they make a promise for federal dollars and go after a federal award, that award is delivered over ten years. The performance is over six years. You know, any any assistance that can be done to bring another internet provider into the marketplace, um, help them be competitive, and you know if it's it's a low risk investment to front some of that money 
at the start of that 10-year federal payout dollar, and essentially they're paying you back with federal payments uh, through that. You know, we've seen one provider do that in Southside Virginia, a universal service project in Prince Edward, Cumberland, Lunenburg counties. now is just inviting a lot more questions than answers um, so um, I can look into kind of the, the recent information that we've pulled on it and send it over um, but I think that point that Chandler just brought up um, the more where we can bring assets to the table uh, to help those smaller providers particularly in communities like where you are is going to be really really beneficial because those small providers um, uh, they serve a small part of the of the population but they also serve, by and large, the hardest to serve parts of the population. Um, so, but they don't have a lot of assets at hand and the Universal Service Fund is complicated, it's underfunded, and we could talk about that for several hours. Um, but it's a good point, and Chandler, I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, one of the organizations that we uh, work with is called uh, Schmidt Futures. Um, it's actually Eric Schmidt's it's technically an LLC. It's a philanthropic venture, as I believe what they call it. Um, I don't know. Uh, but one of the things that they have mentioned uh, is a lot of interest in um, creating um, opportunities like this. Where can they generate some loans um, and um, opportunities for loans? Because again, it gets back to the source of sustainable funding because grants will really only get us so far, uh, particularly in communities where the um, operating expenditures are not going to be um, sustainable in the long run. So we could talk about this for a long time. But Chris, we can connect separately. Try not to think like a bank. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you because these are some going to be some of your more risky providers. And it's and the good thing about the federal money, as Chandler said earlier, they're getting the repayment of the federal investments. It's just that the FCC has broken it out of one tenth of a payment over ten years, but they've got to be built out by six years. So the providers have a guaranteed source of revenue. One, they're going to be signing up customers, and two, they're going to get repayment from the FCC. But when you look at it, and, and we've, we've actually worked with our community development finance institution, Virginia Community Co Capital, and so they've presented options, but part of the problem is you're, they, need it, they want someone to capitalize the loan fund, and so we can't capitalize the loan fund as a, as a state agency. And so what does that look like? And maybe that's a role where if a CDFI was willing to do, do some lending, could the philanthropy, the philanthropy sector capitalize the, 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 the loan fund? That might be a great resource. And there's 